church, let's stand and praise God as we sing the Christmas song, Heart the Herald Angels Sing.
you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah. Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. In Isaiah chapter 11 verse 6, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them.
So we're having a few technical difficulties, but we're all at peace, right? We're not anxious about that, are we? No, we are not. Uh, so uh, I want to say, you know, first of all, I want to say thank you to the guys that work in the back of the auditorium. Yeah. Uh, especially, you know, during the Christmas season, there's so many things to keep up with, different videos and things that we're doing. And, uh, and it just so happens that uh, Darren Patterson, who is really our main guy that leads, uh, that runs our computer, uh, is out of town. And I appreciate Tracy stepping up and filling in that. And Tracy, doing a great job, brother. On that note... I want you to uh, listen to this first statement, and if you take notes, I, I really would like you to write this down, because this is what the this is, I think, something that affects every single person in here today, and is especially true. It can be especially true in this time of season. Uh, and this is a statement: If you are on a continuous search to be offended you will always find what you are looking for. If you're always on a continuous search to be offended, you will always find what you're looking for. We live in an age of perpetual offense. And I, you know, it's, I don't know if it's just me, but it seems like ever since COVID pandemic, that that sense of offense has been elevated. And I don't know that it's ever really, you know, it's come down some. It's, you know, we've gone back to more like normal. But, but during COVID, I don't know if you remember. I'm sure you don't. But during COVID, how, you know, just so, there was just so much tension and so much offense being had. But, but since then, it seems like we've stayed on kind of a trajectory like that. And, and again, I mentioned, I think, last week that we've just been through the, the election season and and uh, boy, if you watch the news and didn't matter, it doesn't matter which, which news station you happen to watch, you're going to see somebody that's offended about something. And um, I want to talk about that today because how can, we, how can we have peace in our hearts if we co are constantly offended by things around us? It just the two things just don't seem to me to go together. In fact, I've seen that in my own life. Being offended is inevitable. Okay? Nobody in, here is in, nobody in here is immune. Being offended is inevitable, but living offended is a choice. You know, we, we have to choose whether we're going to be in a, a constant state of being offended and having offense, or we're going to choose to walk in a, in a more of a mindset and a heart of peace in our lives. That's why the title of this sermon series is Prince of Peace. And we started last week with the understanding. We talked about finding your peace. The only way that you can truly find peace is if you find Jesus because he is the prince. That is, he is the, the Lord of peace. And that's why the, uh, the angels, when they announced his birth, they said, uh, we bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior. He is the prince. He is the prince of peace, and he is the prince of joy. So today, the, the sermon series title is Prince of Peace. Today, we're going to be talking about peace with others. I thought about a good subtitle for that, but it was a little bit too long to put on the screen, and that is, Lord, help me. These people are driving me crazy. <laughs> And so we all have people, and I'm not going to, you know, don't buy, anybody raise your hand and certainly don't look at the person, okay? <laughs> but how many of you in here today know that, that there's somebody in your life that just constantly, you know, irritates you and, and, and offends you in some way? Uh, that's because we live in a world like that. And so uh, today, I just want you to know that if you were to make a list of all the people that are hard and difficult for you, you might also keep in mind that you may be on somebody's list. <laughs> if we all make a list, you may make it onto somebody else's list. So the, the, the uh, message today is about how we can have peace with others because if we're talking about peace, how can we have peace in our lives if we don't have peace with others? 
So, are you ready for a you ready for a hard, difficult verse this morning? Are you ready for something really challenging, really hard this morning? If you're saying you're ready for it, say ready. ready. All right, then let's go. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 14. Now, this is tough here. Listen. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 14. Paul writes this to the church in Rome. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. See, most of us are in trouble already, aren't we? I mean, we're already in tough territory. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. What does it mean to be persecuted? Well, it can mean somebody's literally, as they were in these days, coming after you to try to take your life, try to take what's yours, try to take your belongings. For us, it may just be somebody saying something that's offensive. Maybe it's somebody that we think is ignoring us, or we could go on and on with a list of things that we take offense at. But Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Do not curse them. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Just a quick thought, just a quick question. Which is more difficult? Is it easier to rejoice with somebody as things are happening that are good and they're, they're excited and they're full of joy? Is it easier to rejoice with them or is it easier for us to mourn with somebody who's going through a tough time? I hate to say this, but I believe that in honesty, for most of us, it, we find it probably easier to grieve with somebody that's grieving and has lost than it is for us to have joy with somebody that's had something really good happen in their lives. Why is that? Well, that's kind of what the, the, it, the, the heart is in this message, and that is that we have this tendency, we have this tendency to begrudge or to be offended rather than to be joyful. We have, a, we have a tendency to be offended by somebody's success than we are to be joyful with them in their success. So this is, these are all issues that, that Paul is writing about that just seem to kind of run contrary to some of our basic human nature. He says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, and I make note of this, 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 so, this sentence is so important. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, when it makes that statement, as far as it depends on you, that really puts us into a place of having to, it's not, it's not necessarily an absolute clear statement. It's, it's kind of like, okay, in every situation, we are going to have to Evaluate. We're going to have to do some accountability. We're going to have to think through. We may have to have a talk with ourselves to, to decide what, what, what is my part in this and, and how, do I, how do I let the air out of this offense rather than making it blow up higher and higher? What do, what do, how do we do that? That's what we want to talk about today. So let's start with those first words. Paul said, bless those who persecute you. The word bless is eulageo uh, in the Greek. And it, it literally means that EU means good, okay? That means good, and logos means word. So what it's saying is to speak well of, to wish the best blessing for someone, okay? When he says, when he says bless and do not curse, he's saying to wish, say the, the best words that you can say about them, not curse them. Greek language that command is exactly that. It is a command. When it says, bless those who persecute you, it is not a suggestion. It is not just, okay, here's a, you know, in a lot of times when we read, for instance, in Proverbs, what we read are, are just uh, thoughts, things of wisdom. Just here's some wise advice. That's not this. This is, a, this is a command. It's put in the present imperative tense in the Greek, which means that it is something that is continually ongoing. So it's to be... It's, a, it's to be a committal blessing to those who are a continual problem. Be a continual blessing to those who are a continual problem. In other words, it's not just something we do once and then we're over. It's something we're probably going to have to do over and over and over again. Now, we could just quickly mention a few situations. For instance, uh, in a marriage, 
You know, you're going to be married. You're gonna, you, this is not something that you just do one. This is just not a one-time event. This is a lifetime commitment, right? So, so we're talking about a lifetime situation. You go to a job every day, and you probably work with some of the same people, and some of them people drive you crazy, right? And so, we're, it's a, it's, so it's an ongoing thing you do every day. Some of you go to school, and you're going to school with somebody, and, those, and there are certain people that you're going to school with. So you see what I'm saying? There are, there are times when we're in a... We're in an ongoing situation. And is that also true right here? Do you go to church with the same people? Week after week, month after month, year after year, and some of you are saying, oh, my God, yes. And some of them are driving me crazy. Don't forget, you make somebody's list. You're on it. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, so we're in the same chapter. Okay, so this is in the same letter, in the same chapter. Let's go back to the beginning of that chapter and, and listen to what Paul says to begin this chapter. He says, in view of God's mercy. Man, don't miss that. In view of God's mercy. He says, in view of God's mercy, mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't forget, listen. Worship isn't just the songs that we sing on Sunday mornings. They are. That is worship. But that's not all that worship is. Worship is not just the songs we sing on Sunday morning. Worship is the lives that we live every day of the week of our lives. Living sacrifice. He says, make yourself a living sacrifice. See, where we're going with this is that it's going to be impossible to have peace with others if you don't understand how how to be a living sacrifice. Because everybody's going to be offended at some point, and you have to decide how you are going to respond in the midst of that offense. And it's going to require that you be a living sacrifice. By the way, living sacrifice, uh, when, I, when I begin to think about that, you think about, like, is that, for those that are English people, is that an oxymoron? <laughs> living Sacrifice. See, when I think about a sacrifice, I naturally, my mind goes back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. And so they, they brought the animals and then they were sacrificed and sacrifices that were placed on the altar were dead. So a living sacrifice. We're not talking about something that's dead. We're talking about something that is ongoing, that is living. He says, be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which means that it is something that we're going to have to do every day, something we're going to have to do continually all of our lives. And, And how did he say that we do that? Look at the first verse again, the first second part of that verse, in view of God's mercy to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Let me ask you something. How merciful has God been to you? How much junk has God put up with from you and from me? If God were making a list of all the people that have offended him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on the list. Okay, I'm going to be on that list and so are you. Just saying. <laughs> Oxymoron, by the way, is something that seems to be kind of a contradiction within the terms. It's a, uh, for instance, a, a jumbo shrimp, you know, that's an oxymoron. Bittersweet, okay? Act naturally. <laughs> Think about it. Living sacrifice. How do we do that? Well, we're told that Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. So you see, there was actually a death, a sacrifice of a lamb that was made that died, but he died in our place so that we could then become a living sacrifice. He died that we could live. He laid down his life. Now we then need to to lay down our lives every day. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not me, not I that lives, but it is what? It is Christ who lives in me. It is not something you can do. What did we say last week? Peace can only come from God. He says those whose thoughts are kept on him, he will keep in perfect peace. The only way that we can be a living sacrifice is if we're filled with the Holy Spirit of the one who was sacrificed for us. 
Let's go back to Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 16. Paul says to us as his people, live in harmony with one another. Harmony. I asked Joe in the first service. I'm not going to put him on the spot. Oh, yeah, I am. What is harmony, Joe? <laughs> to you, what is harmony? Okay, well, that's perfect. Voices working together to create a beautiful sound. We can apply the same principle to instruments too, right? Uh, to, if, if instruments aren't in harmony, if they're not working together, if they're not, if they're not one, then you're going to get a bad sound. And if voices aren't blended together in the right way, then you're not going to get a good sound. And if our church is not in harmony, what is the world going to see? It's not going to be a good sound. It's not going to be a, a pretty picture. Let me ask you. You don't have to raise your hand on this. I just want you to think about it. How many of you have been in a church before where it was everything but peace, everything but harmony? It's not a good testimony to the world around us. In fact, Paul, Jesus said the world will know you not by how right you are, but how much you love one another. How much harmony there is in your midst. And that doesn't mean that you accept things that are wrong. There are things going on all around us in churches all around us that are wrong. And yes, you are responsible to evaluate those things and look for a church where, there, where there's truth and where the Bible's being taught and you can be in harmony with those who have those common beliefs. That's why I would also say to someone that if you don't agree with, if you can in your heart agree with, a, with the, the testimony and the teachings and the preaching and the doctrine of a certain church, then no, you do not need to be there. You need to go somewhere else. Because we are here to have harmony, to have one voice, to speak as one to the world around us. He says, live in harmony with one another. But look at the rest of this verse. Do not be proud do not be conceited. What does it mean to be proud? What does it mean to be conceited? Let me ask you this question. Let me ask it this way. Where is the focus of those two things? To be proud, if you're proud, the focus is on who? Not on everybody else. It's on you. If you're conceited, where is the focus? Is it on everybody else? No, it is on you. And Paul says, do not be proud. Do not be conceited. In the Greek, it translates this way. Do not be proud and do not be conceited. It means what it says and it doesn't matter how you translate it. We are to lay aside our pride. We are to lay aside our conceit. Do not be proud. Do not be conceited. I think sometimes, I might make some of you mad here, <laughs> but I think sometimes we're more focused and more, we put more importance on being right than we do on loving others. Jesus didn't tell us to be right, but he did tell us to be loving. Now, that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that, that, uh, that we don't evaluate things. That doesn't mean that there's not a, a, a truth that we believe and that there's things that are wrong, there are things that are, that are right, there are things that are correct, there are things that are incorrect. And yes, we're each responsible to, to hold things up in this world. We're to hold them up to the cannon, the measuring rod. What is our measuring rod? What is, that, what is the cannon? It is the Bible. It is the word of God. And yes, we are all responsible for holding up what we're hearing and what we're seeing. We're to hold that up and, and, and hold it up against the word of God. And even if you do that and you find that you believe that you are right, the Bible does tell us to speak the truth. But how are we to speak the truth? The Bible says to speak the truth in love. And if you can't do that, then be quiet. Because if you don't do that, then that means you are walking in disobedience to what the Word of God says. Here's what I do believe, though, honestly. I believe if we're all honest and if we all just take this to heart, I believe that we can all do that. We can all simply say what is so for us and what we, we have studied and what we believe. And, and we can state that without, without being angry, without being obscene, without being proud and conceited. We can just simply say, this is what I believe the Bible teaches and this is how I'm going to live my life. I love this statement. It's not mine. It says, stop listening to respond, but listen to understand. 
Stop listening to respond. You see, that's the posture we often take when we, when we begin to feel offense. You hear what I'm saying? As soon as we feel some offense, our posture becomes one of, I'm listening, but I'm listening so that I can respond to you. I'm listening so that I can find out what's wrong with what you're saying so I can, so I can get, come back at you. But what's more important is how can we do that if we don't understand what's being said? If we haven't listened close enough to somebody to understand what it is that they're saying to us, how can we then respond to them? I had a conversation on Friday night with my oldest brother. We had all of our family in for, uh, for a holiday. We, we get together every year. My brother and their wives, we come together uh, for a party, and we hosted that this year. We move it around. And I hope, uh, I hope my oldest brother's watching. I don't, I don't know if he'd be watching on t- online or not, but if he is, hey, Butch. <laughs> his name is actually Charles, but we call him Butch all, all, all of his life. But, but he, he and I don't, you know, we don't see things exactly the same when it comes to spiritual things. But we had a talk, and, and it's not by accident. You know, I'm like, okay, I'm, I just prepared this sermon you know, finished it this past week and for the weekend. And, 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 and so I got to give my brother credit because he listened and tried to understand, I think, what I was saying, what I was communicating with him. And, and I got to admit, that helped me in turn to listen carefully to what he was saying so that I could understand. Now, did we, did we finally reach, oh, consensus and harmony and perfect agreement? No. That's right, we're brothers. How could that happen? No. No, we we didn't. But that's true in a lot of things in life. But what we did do is walk away from one another still loving each other. You know, not offended, not angry, not put out, not put off. If you can't see another perspective or hear and understand another perspective, you're going to live a very limited life because it demands, life demands that we do so. Yes, we are to speak the truth in love, but we can't without listening in love first. Okay? We've got to understand. A counselor explained this to me years ago. In fact, I actually studied this a little bit well, just a few years ago when I was doing my undergraduate study. Okay? It was a lot of years ago, actually. <laughs> But I, 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 my undergraduate, I have an undergraduate degree, uh, a, a bachelor's degree in psychology, and a, a bachelor's degree in Christian studies. At the school I went to, you had to have a double major, not a major and a minor. And so one of the things that I did study is something that I was reminded of years later, and there was actually a, a term, term for this way of thinking or this study, and that is called Gestalt psychology, Gestalt therapy. But, it, but it, it's based on, here's something we need to always remember. Anything that's really true is usually based upon observing what God has already put in place and done. But we have been created. We are, we are made such that we, we, we look at things two ways. We look at the parts of something, but then we're looking at the parts of something in order that we can put it together and make a whole. And sometimes we want to we wanna jump to the whole without understanding all the parts. I don't know, I should have, I meant to put some on the screen and I just totally forgot. But have you ever looked at any of these pictures that when you first look at it, it looks like two crows looking at each other? And suddenly somebody kind of points out the, if you look at it differently, then oh, oh, what you see is two beautiful ladies or something weird, you know? It's like, it's like we, our minds are kind of wired that way to, 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 to give something a meaning, give something a story, to give something an image. We, we tend to do that. And, and so... The same thing is true not only with our vision and how we see things, but it's also true of how we hear things, how we observe things, how we respond to things. And what we tend to do is we tend to give a story to an event, even if we don't fully understand. That's why I'm talking about it's so important that we listen to understand. Because how can we, how can we give meaning to something? How can we understand something if we haven't listened, if we haven't understood Let me give you an example. I used this in the first service. I'll use it here too. But on a a given Sunday, um, you know, 
There's so many things going on. And one of the things I love to do is before the service, I think the two most important, some of the two most important times in a, in a worship service is the 10 minutes after and the 10 minutes before. That's when we're all talking and visiting and getting to know each other. And I'm, I'm walking around and seeing people and everything. But then sometimes there's something that's happening that m maybe none of you know anything about. And so, you know, I may have walked past you at some point, never did look to you, see you and say, hi, how you doing? And, and so what do you do with that? Let me tell you what we tend to do. This, is, now, this applies to so many areas of your life. It applies to your husband, your wife, your children, your parents. The guy out on the highway. Okay? We tend to give meaning to, to a story. We, give to give, we tend to give our meaning to something so that if I walked past somebody and didn't stop and say, oh, hello, I'm good, it's good to see you this morning, and I walk right past them, now there's a couple of meanings they could give. Well, pastor's probably busy. You know, obviously he's got a lot going on. Or you could give the meaning, oh, he sure is rude. <laughs> I mean, see, that's not, that's not about me. It's just an example. I've, but I have had that happen. And so have you. But we all tend to give meaning, and if we don't listen, if we don't understand, then how can we know the true meaning of something? Well, what I love is, and I've told this to people so many times, that if you think something, let's say, let's just use the word, if you're offended with something, if it relates to me, you know what I appreciate? I appreciate someone that would come to me and say, this offended me, this really hurt me, or this bothered me. And now there's two responses I'm going to have to something like that. And you would too. See, one response would be, they were absolutely right. And I would have to say, I'm sorry I did that. But see, what, what does that offer an opportunity? That offers the opportunity to the one who has offended you to say, I'm sorry. And that gives us then the opportunity to release that thing. Or the other thing that can happen is, the other thing that can happen is, People give a meaning to it and say, this is, this is what he meant, by this, this is what he's doing, and, and that, that doesn't go away. It's not reconciled. It's not resolved. That happens in your families. It happens in your schools. It happens in your workplace. It happens everywhere. I love this. I heard this. Somebody else say this, too. He said, I did, uh, when, when, when I do something that offends you, I expect you to understand my reasons. But when you do something to offend me, I want to give it my story. That's what we tend to do. And that's what I'm trying to tell us that we should not do. That's what the Bible is telling us that we should not do. The devil wants your story about others to be accusations. Do you hear that? Why is that true? Because he is, that is one of his names, is the accuser. He wants to, he wants to, in, he wants to work in your life to make you give the story of accusation to what somebody else has done or what somebody else is doing. God wants your story about others to be one based in love. So let me put it this way. The devil wants your story based in accusations. God wants your story rooted in love. You might want to think about this one too. Your life is too short and your calling too great to be offended by something small. Let me back up to a verse. Ephesians 4, 2 says this, be patient with each other. <laughs> well, we can read over these things pretty quickly, can't we? And what did that just say? Whew. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because why? Because of your love. Man, imagine if Jesus was offended all the time. I love that. When you read the New Testament, you just don't see Jesus being that way. You don't see Jesus storming around saying, man, Matthew didn't pay attention to my sermon. He wasn't listening. Oh, Thomas, you never can. He won't believe anything. I got to tell him over and over again. I healed 10 lepers. Only one of them came back and said, thank you. Boy, I'm offended. I'm going to go and get them told. You don't see Jesus doing that. Proverbs 19.11 says this, a person's wisdom yields patience. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Overlooking offenses isn't the same thing as saying they're okay. It's not the same thing as approving of them. 
What does it mean? It's a conscious decision to let it go. It just means when you say, over, looking over, it means that you're just going to let it go. You're not going to let some small things build up in your life that you take offense to that gives you a way of living that is living offended. And when you let it go, let me tell you, it's a form of forgiveness. You're just letting it go. Instead of on focus, focusing on the offense, dwelling on it, how you're going to repay it, I'm going to show them how it feels. Choose to pass over it. Just choose to pass over it. The Hebrew word there is the word avor. And that just means, that's what it literally means, to pass over. You know, in our marriages, in our homes, our families, in our workplace, everywhere we go, we're going to be constantly having things happen that are offensive. And I think what Paul is telling us here, what, what Jesus is telling us here, and what the Old Testament is telling us here in Proverbs is that we will have peace in our life when we learn to look over things. In fact, there's a scripture. I don't think I put it in here. Yeah, no, I didn't. But I think it's in uh, maybe Second Peter, but it, it says that love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. And, and all that saying is the same thing. It's all in agreement. That's Peter saying the same thing. It's simply this, that people are going to do things that are wrong, that are going to offend you. But love covers those things. Your love for them allows you to overlook, over, not, not dwell on them, but to let them go. That doesn't mean that everything in life, that doesn't mean you don't sometimes have that talk. In fact, one of the books that I... Uh, one of the books that I, I love is, a, and I only really remember one major thing out of it. It's called Crucial Conversations. And it asks this question. It says, when you're going into, uh, but there's an explanation about what a crucial conversation is. But let me, I think it probably is self-explanatory. You know, you have a lot of conversations. But when you're going into a, a conversation with your child, you're going into a conversation with your husband, your wife, or, or somebody, and you know that the outcome of this conversation is crucial. You know what I'm saying? A crucial conversation. The question that this book taught me to ask was this. Before you have that conversation, ask yourself this question. What is it that I want to get out of this? What is, I, what is it that I desire to actually happen? And I will tell you this. Most of the time, the answer to that question was, I want the relationship to be restored. I want the relationship to be healed. I want our relationship to grow stronger. So that then guides the conversation and helps you uh, think about the things that are going to reach that objective rather than becoming angry and saying the wrong things. Life is too short. And your calling is too great to be offended by small things. Jesus tell, didn't tell us to be right. He told us to be loving and that is probably the greatest thing I can say to you today it all comes from the word of God about how to have peace with others and it, it is a choice that we make again what is it we're all going to be offended at some point but we get to choose to either live offended or not Heavenly Father we thank you this morning for your grace we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your kindness to us. Lord, we ask that you would walk with us through the days ahead. And, and in this time of season, Lord, when it's so easy, so many things are going on, so many things are happening, Lord, it, it's so easy to get anxious and in our anxiety to become offended and to be hurt or to be angry. Lord, I just ask today in Jesus' name that you would help us to just let it go. Just let it go. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. We ask you to stand with me as we go into this time of invitation today. I want you to know that we don't always, the, the chance to do the right thing isn't necessarily going to always be there. You know, there have been some times and some people in my life that, that, that I got offended with or got hurt by disillusioned with and let that disillusionment
fracture that relationship forever. And so you wonder then, what could have happened if we would have just made that phone call? What could have happened if we just made that visit and said, look, let's talk this out. Let me help me understand what it is that's going on in your life. See, I think that's God's way. So I'm going to challenge you this morning. There's some maybe here today that have never given your lives, your heart to Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to make that decision because, listen, you can't do what we're talking about today in your own strength. It only comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. So if that's you, then the invitation is open to you. I would love to pray with you this morning to receive Christ as your Savior, to, to be changed completely. But I have a feeling that for many of us as believers, we've got a lot to deal with here. Go back and study it. Go back and read it. Let it sink in. And let it guide your path. As we worship together, this is your invitation. Let's join me in worship. Be seated. You know, uh, I didn't ask his permission to do this, but I don't know if y'all noticed, but every Sunday, um, Bill comes to the altar and prays. Yeah, you notice that? I finally just had to ask him. I stopped him and I said, Will, I mean, Bill, why do you come to the altar every week and pray? <laughs> I love his response. He says, Because I'm dangerous out there on my own. <laughs> Isn't that the truth of all of us? We're all kind of dangerous out there on our own. Don't we all, you know, responding to what God is saying and letting him change us. Thank you. God bless you. Okay. Uh, it's time for our uh, Lottie Moon video. So let's, let's play that video. No? no? It's a great video. <laughs> it, it tells you all about how all over the world it shows you people being baptized. That's the, that's the heart of it for me. That's when I saw it. I said, I love the videos of all over countries and nations around where people are being baptized because they've come to faith in Christ. And, and the reason that they were coming to faith in Christ is because there were... They, they don't, Lostness is the world's greatest problem, but God has provided a solution, and that solution is the gospel, and together we are reaching the nations.
See, I told you it was better than I could tell you. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, the heart of it is this. Those people that are there sharing Christ and baptizing those people and bringing people to Jesus are missionaries that are sent by um, our church. Now, not just our church alone, but all of our churches working together, sending missionaries around the world. And so uh, every year at Christmas, well, we take up a, what we call the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And don't have time to explain all of that to you, but Lottie Moon was a missionary that uh, was a missionary to China that died in service to the Lord. And this, this offering is named in honor of her. And so uh, every year we receive this offering. And uh, we, we, set a pretty, we set a pretty bold goal, uh, $22,000. That's 1000 more than last year. And uh, I've already told you that, that I, I believe that it was you know, difficult for me to make that decision because of just having finished our capital fund campaign. Many of you are sacrificing already to give to help us build our church larger here. But uh, we're just going to pray and, and see what God does, okay? See what he provides. But last week, our total that we had was $3,150. Uh, let's see where we are now. 3770 That's good. Every bit of glory goes to the Lord. But here's what I want you to know. Usually what we see is those arrows keep getting longer and longer as we go through the month of December. So keep that in your prayers and just be obedient to him. You do that simply by taking one of those blue envelopes that's in the back of the chairs. You put your offering in there. If you put your tithes and other things in there, just make sure that you note, note on the front of the offering envelope uh, how much of that goes to Lottie Moon. You can just put Lottie. You can just put Moon. Or you can put Missions. We'll get it. Okay? We'll... and your connection cards while somewhere around to pick those up. Uh, just a few announcements uh, this morning. The first one, Surviving the Holidays. Uh, that will be taking place. Oh, let me backtrack. Uh, this is a grief share group that will be taking place uh, December 12th, this Thursday, from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, so you can still sign up for that. Today is actually the last day to sign up for this group. Uh, the holidays are, are normally a, a hard time for you or if you just recently lost someone, this is a group where you can come and share that grief and come alongside one another and encourage one another in that time. So please sign up if you would like. Uh, again, today is the last day to do so. Uh, next, our Big Red Barn, uh, Bluegrass, our Bluegrass Band and uh, Choir will be singing at the Big Red Barn in Geronimo again this week as well, uh, Friday the 13th, uh, 7.15 p.m. So if there's a whole bunch of other uh, events and stuff going on out there as well at the Big Red Barn. It's a great time to, or a great place to bring your family out, uh, spend time with church family, just have a great time of fellowship, uh, come out, hear music, eat food. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so please be there if you can. Next, our McQueenie Baptist Church Christmas program will be taking place next Sunday, next Sunday at 6 p.m. Uh, there's a reception that will follow that uh, in the fellowship hall as well with Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus for the uh, little ones, uh, and also I've heard something about maybe Frito Pies being in the reception as well, so if you weren't planning on going, I bet you are now, uh, but please uh, come out and support, come out and listen to music, worship, uh, and just have fellowship with one another. And then lastly, our Christmas Eve candlelight service uh, titled God With Us will be taking place December 24th. Uh, we're having two services, one at 5 p.m., one at 6 p.m. These services are not long at all, maybe 45 minutes uh, at the most, 40, 45 minutes. Uh, the nursery's open for toddlers, uh, but that leaves plenty of time for uh, you still to go and uh, get to your uh, plans and get things set up for Christmas Day. So please be there for that as well. That's all that I got. All right. Thank you, Will. We appreciate that. And uh, I know, you know, nobody here at McQueen Baptist Church can say we don't have anything to do. Okay, we have, we have plenty for you to do and to be involved in during this Christmas season. And I did want to remind you of one other thing. The candles on the candle that we're lighting, they're not there to remind you how many shopping days you have left. <laughs> Although, you know, I see only two more candles to light, and then, we, then it's Christmas Eve, which is the center candle. But uh, those are there to remind us uh, what Christmas really is all about and just to be reminded each week as we prepare our hearts to celebrate the birth of our Savior. So let's all stand together. We prepare to dismiss this morning. I want to, first of all, just say thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing. Sharon, would you mind leading us in our closing prayer?